How did you get to Temple High? I got do I excuse me. Good stuff for a second. Okay. Do How I, did you get to Temple High? I got to Temple by when we first moved here, we were living in Chicago and we went to the bagel factory. Wait, stop, 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 stop. How'd you get to Temple High? We first moved to Chicago and I was working at Temple Jeremiah. And I don't know what I'm saying, so I'm gonna keep going. Because we didn't move to Chicago. We first when we moved to Phoenix for the first few days after moving, we went to Chompy's. And there, sitting there, is this woman who looks very familiar. I thought, who is she? I said, I've seen this person before. I haven't seen her in a while. And I turned around, and there it was, Shoshana Burke. And we hugged and we kissed each other. We hadn't seen each other in about four or five years. And that was the first start. From then on, I saw Rabbi Bill again and uh, started working together. So it was a wonderful, wonderful beginning. So you had known each other before? We knew each other before. We had worked at a camp doing musicals, Jewish musicals. So he was the director, and I did music, and we wrote A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Tarshish, which was about Jonah. It's a great musical. And, and then was this chance meeting with Shoshana? It was a chance meeting with Shoshana, and from there I started doing bar bat mitzvah tutoring, and then I started seeing her services, and then it just moved from there. What single thing, when, when you look back at uh, the history uh, of the uh, temple and, and your tenure here, really has meant the most to you? That's a tough one. Um, I would say the most important thing about being here is the people and the involvement. I think that, especially from the congregation I was at in Chicago, which was a good congregation, and it was a wealthy congregation. But this is a wealthy congregation of people. People participate and they sing and their willingness to help other people out. I think that's, that's probably the single most important thing and the thing that I would convey to other people about Temple High. There, there, there seems to be um, a lot of music uh, at Temple High, a lot of singing, um, a lot of emphasis on it. How do, you, what do you, how do you see the importance of bringing these words and this music to the temple? I think that music just brings another dimension to prayer, to spirituality, and to your own uh, Jewish feeling. And I think it's vital that we know not only uh, traditional melodies, but new melodies. And really, what I like about the music here is there's a blend of both, and that we've been able to experiment a little bit. And really been trying to blend all our traditions. Tell me what you really like most about Rabbi Burke. Um, his openness and his willingness to try things and his understanding. And tell me what you like most about Ava Keenan. Ava, I would say probably the same, that She's always open to my crazy ideas um, and her willingness to try new things. And I think for both of them, the team spirit is that we really work together. And you don't find that very often. What, what side, what would be really surprising to the congregation um, about the three of you? I mean, the three of you work together almost on a daily basis. Is there, is there something that the three of you share too special that maybe the congregation, maybe in prayer or something, the congregation at all doesn't know about? Um, there are probably a lot of silent things that go on between the three of us. Um, the, a lot of unspoken understandings that happen, which I think help the teamwork. Um, other great things are when we go on the retreats uh, that we share the preparation, we share the experience, and we share the almost debriefing as we go home. That's a very special time for us. Let's wait a second, let it roll a bit. Tell me about some, some funny stories. Uh, there are a lot of funny things that happen. I think the rabbi and I could write a book on all the life cycle things that have happened um, for weddings and bar mitzvahs and namings that have just been so funny. But one very funny thing that happened, we were at a new member's tea and we were going around and introducing each other ourselves and I said hi I'm Sharona Feller I'm the camp 
director of Temple High, and then the rabbi said, hi, I'm Bill Burke, I'm the rabbi of Phoenix. <laughs> so uh, gave him a kind of special note there. <laughs> <laughs> rabbi of Phoenix. <laughs> um, there's one other funny story talking about retreats. It's that the three of us were outside in Prescott, and this is before all the kids came, and we're looking to see how beautiful it is, and we see this very large animal running by, and the person at the camp said, well, that's a javelina. And at that point, the three of us ran through the door. So one little door that was smashed in there as fast as we could to get away from this thing. <laughs> well, what is it? What's a ha- what is a javelina? Is that like a? It's a pig. It's a wild boar. <laughs> <laughs> so the three of us, and we see the hair sticking up. Once it was a riot. You were afraid of a pork attack. <laughs> uh, that's about it. Okay. Um. Why don't you start again? And 
lastly, what? I need uh, Shalom Aleikum. Oh, so you're not going to tape it? I am going to do it here, <laughs> but in order to be able to to be able to go from face to face and keep everything in sync, I need it twice. You need the whole thing? Or yeah, I need it? the whole thing. Okay. And Let me just get the words so I don't mess them up. See so what I want to do is. <laughs> time without words. Um, just humming it or nothing? Nothing, just, just the music. Ava, tell me about uh, your experience, how you feel um, being part of this, uh, this temple. This is like home. I mean, this is, working here has been one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Um, it's a wonderful place. The people are very warm. And the kids in this school are terrific. I get to share in some real life experiences with kids that nobody else gets to really see. Uh, teachers in public schools don't actually have get to share in some of the life cycle events that we get to share, and, and I, I consider it myself very lucky to be able to be involved with people's lives the way I am in the school. There's been an absolutely phenomenal growth um, in the Sunday school, the religious school here, to where I guess we're looking in 1989, 1990, we may be the largest Jewish Sunday school in all of Arizona. Um, why do you think that is? I think that's because there's a, a special excitement here. Uh, that there's, there's warmth in the school and it kind of you know, that excitement it attracts other people. Everybody wants to kind of get on the bandwagon and be a part of something that's, that's really exciting. And um, I think the more people you get, the more you attract because other people talk about the school. Like, they have friends. and, and I, I talk to a lot of prospective members who have already come here and say, gosh, we've heard about how great Temple High is and how exciting the school is. And we'd like to be a part of that part of the vision of, of 
what's happening in the uh, Jewish community there. To those people who say, uh, you know, my kids, uh, you know, they have to go to school Monday through Friday, and they have to do this and they have to do that. And now, you know, Hebrew school, that's just another thing we're adding on to, to the child. Is it too much? What do you say to when you, when you want to answer something like that? Most of the time the parents tell me about their experiences with religious school and how much they disliked it. And I tell them that our kids don't have the same experiences anymore. That most of the kids in this school come here and love coming here and enjoy it. And they're learning about their heritage. It, it's something that we owe them to give them the opportunity to learn about and to be a part of. And they don't have negative experiences here. They have wonderful experiences that make them want to, to become part of the Jewish community here. And we don't ask that much of the kids. We ask a lot less of the kids in, in terms of time spent here as compared to what most of us did when we were kids. Yet they seem to be learning just as much and feeling much, as much a part of the community as we did. How did you uh, get to Temple High? How, how, did, how did you get to this, to where you are today? And what were the roots? I'm uh, practically a native of Phoenix. And we were married, my husband and I were married by a local rabbi at a local congregation here, which we stayed at for five years. It was very, very large. And, and we left the city for about three years. And when we came back, we decided to look around. And, uh, We'd never been part of a reform congregation before. We walked in the doors at Temple Chi, even though it was a church. There was such warmth, and we just felt instantly a part of it. And that's after going to every other synagogue in the city and giving them all the exact same chance. And we loved it. And I got involved in the school because I was very concerned about the education of my children, especially in a congregation that was this tiny. Would they be able to meet enough Jewish kids? Would the education be as good as what I wanted them to have, especially in a Reformed congregation? Um, I was worried, and I'm not worried anymore. I, I, I took an active part. My children got a wonderful education here. They're very rooted in their Judaism. They had good experiences here. And what started out as a volunteer position became part of my life. Um, I was looking for a career change just about the time the first job um, in the school became available and I just kind of went in and I've loved it ever since. What did you do for a living before you did this? I was an accountant uh, which is what my undergraduate degree is in in, in accounting and um, I worked in the field for four years which I think is where I got a lot of my administrative skills that helped me in the school but it wasn't enough people contact always loved children. I did teach for a little while in um, Palm Springs, California, in some part-time teaching. And I loved the, the actual contact with the kids. My first experience was teaching first grade at uh, a religious school in Palm Springs. And it was wonderful. My son happened to have been in the first grade class, which is why I really wanted to do it. But I knew it was something I really wanted to be involved in somehow. And when the job became available here, it was just a natural progression. Even though I was very nervous about being able to do the job, uh, the rabbi encouraged me uh, and made me feel really comfortable and made me really feel like I could do it. In uh, talking about uh, the rabbi and, and Sharona, here, let me just do a little focusing thing here. What is it about Rabbi Burke um, that you like the most? Um, he is the most sincere, dedicated, kind person I have ever known. And, um, he's just so committed to Judaism, to this temple, and to this school that uh, he just makes you feel like you, you want to be there working with him and for this temple. It's, it's just been wonderful 
working with him and, and seeing the dedication that he's had to, to Temple High. Same with Sharona. I, the three of us are, work, we work very, very well together. We enjoy working together and we seem to complement each other. We all have strengths and weaknesses in different areas so that we we just seem to be a great team. It makes it very enjoyable. Plus, I think it it's part of what makes the school as good as it is and the retreats that we do and all the other programming is because we, the three of us, love what we're doing and work very well together. Is there any type of special moments that the three of you have that maybe the congregation as a whole doesn't know about? Do you pray together in the morning? Do you do, ever do anything special like that? The rabbi and I do pray just about every morning together. The staff before we do the praying, generally studies for a couple of minutes in the morning. Right now we're studying Pirkei Avot, the sayings of our fathers. And we take a couple of minutes to start our day that way. And then the rabbi and I pray, which is another aspect of my life that has, made me, has happened because I'm here. I've been able to um, become much more spiritual, enjoy my Judaism much more, and, and I feel that that has started here. Um, some of the other things we do as a staff that sometimes people have, have seen, uh, when we plan some of these events, we generally have to block off time well in advance for all three of us to be able to spend some time planning. And it, there's a lot of excitement when we, we sit down to do a retreat, for instance, this last family retreat we did. And the greatest thing is when you hear Sharona go, oh, oh, oh. We, then we know it's a great idea. That's uh, we can tell by how excited everybody gets, and the, and the discussions that happen and the planning that we do is just it's fun just even doing the planning because we have such a great time doing it. And when we we get there, we know when when things we do are well received, we just have to look at each other and we just know it's because we've spent so much time doing it and we've had such a good time putting it all together. It's very rewarding. Even when you go on a retreat and you think you're going to be attacked by a wild pig? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm not the world's greatest camper. And I even remember the very first retreat was at um, Camp Pearlstein, which is very well lit. But even having to go around just to check on the kids at night to make sure they were in cabins, I remember actually having to hold on to Rabbi Burke's jacket because I was afraid to walk alone at night. Now I can actually do that by myself. There's another thing I learned at um, Temple High. But yes, the, the javelina or whatever it was, it really was a dog, um, was was kind of a, a funny moment. It's not, it's not the only thing I've been afraid of. I don't like the spiders. And, uh, most everybody knows if I, if I see a bug, they, they hear hysterical screaming. But uh, we've overcome that, and we've had some, some great times. In your years here at the temple, what one moment sticks out in your mind as as the high point of Temple High? The high point of Temple High. Hmm. There's so many that I, I don't know if I can think of just one thing. Um, I think it's just been a combination of things. I, I sat on the um, the search committee for Rabbi Burke, and I think the time when he finally decided to take the job, and I don't know if you know, he he originally turned us down, and then later we just out decided to take one more shot at giving him a call, just in case he changed his mind, and um, he did. And I think that changed the history of Temple High. I mean, I think that's when um, that I knew that Temple High was going to be a great synagogue. And How happen. did you find Rabbi Burke? Um, he applied through the union. Through the, I don't know. Bonnie Goldberg led the search committee. She's a very extremely thorough person, very well organized, and uh, we spent months and months, weekly, putting together a um, questions to ask him. And 
we grilled him. There were 60 questions on this list that were unbelievable. And there was something about Rabbi Burke that was different than all of the other candidates. And I think we all felt a horrible disappointment when he felt that he couldn't take the job because of personal things in his life. And the day he said he would do it, this committee that had invested so much time and wanted him so badly knew that that was going to be a, a change in history for Temple Pride. And uh, it was exciting. A lot of people really worry about, as their children grow up and hit the teens, they really worry about them going crazy, becoming very rebellious. And, um, I noticed with your, your children, um, you have extraordinary children with, um, with great dreams and aspirations, not afraid of their Jewishness, not ashamed of it. Um, what, what about Jewish education and Jewish family life do you think really helps a family turn on like that? Well, um, Jewish camping is the real key to wonderful Jewish education experiences. My kids, and we all know, I've had my moments with my my rebellious children too, but, but you're right, they are strongly Jewish, they're committed to Judaism, but both my husband and myself felt it was real important for them to have a lot of Jewish experiences that were a lot of fun for them. And they started going to camp when they were seven years old. And in fact, my oldest is going to be a counselor. Since the first year he's old enough, he's going to be a counselor at Camp Swig this summer. That gave them such good experiences that when they came back to school, they were still really high about what they knew from camp. And it gave them the edge in religious school, too, so they always felt good about being here and excited about it. And, and youth grouping has also been important. We're a young congregation that doesn't have a lot of kids in the teenage years. So we're, we're building. I, I think one of these days we will have the most magnificent, largest teenage youth group that's ever been in this valley. Right now we're struggling with the number of kids that we have and making them feel comfortable. And I think that we as parents need to push our children to participate in those kind of things. They enjoy it when they're here, and I think it's a key to keep keeping them linked to the Jewish community here. Because when they get out into our high schools and they're a minority, they don't have that many Jewish friends. And this is one place they can always feel safe and they can be with Jewish kids. And I think later on in their lives, they'll remember these times, just as I did when I was a kid. My Jewish ties were, were not that strong, because there were very few Jewish kids in Phoenix when I grew up here but I do remember them fondly, and something kept me keep coming back. I'm, I'm still here. What would you like to say that I haven't asked you? I'd like to say Mazel Tov to Temple High on 13 wonderful years. I think this is a wonderful institution. I think we have great potential for the future, no matter how big we get. There are still, there's still the warmth here I look forward to being here for many, many years. Okay, great. What I needed to have you do now <laughs> is I need I need to get some pictures of you working in your office. Um, I, then just pick. Rabbi, Rabbi Burke, let's start at the beginning, and I guess that would be. Um, Tell me about the experience of uh, uh, joining Temple High, coming to be its rabbi. Well, I first heard about this synagogue through Rabbi Morris Kurtzer, who was visiting at Stanford University when I was in Palo Alto, and he told me about this very interesting group of people who were building a synagogue out here in Paradise Valley in Arizona. And he said, uh, he said, this is a real interesting group of people. And he said, they're the kind of folks that roll up their sleeves and pitch in and, and do things. In fact, he told me the story of the fact that they were building this synagogue with their own bare hands. 
and that made quite an impression on me. And I decided because I wanted to be in a synagogue that had the chance. To, 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 I wanted, wanted to be in a place where I could grow with the synagogue and uh, not have to move around too much if possible, and to be able to. Um, uh, marry the same kids that I bar mitzvah, and, and uh, I also wanted to be in the southwest or in the west coast, and so I, th I thought I'd check it out and looked into it and uh, found out that it was indeed a very interesting place, a young synagogue with great potential, and uh, I haven't been disappointed. How many families were here, and how, how many people in the how many people in the Sunday school were here when you had yeah, about you 95, 97 families? Very quickly jumped up to like 100 and 105. Um, when I first came, we had about 95 kids in the school when I arrived, and we've we've uh, tripled in size. We're we're a little over 300 uh, now. A little over 300 families, and and uh, getting close to 350 kids in the school. What what is it? What are some of the things about this congregation uh, that really you like the best, that makes you feel the best? Now this congregation has, I, I really feel this congregation has a soul. Uh, there's been, uh, I feel that, that, it's, that the record of caring when, when caring really needed to come out has been excellent. Uh, looking out for those that needed help, needed extra hand. Uh, that that's that's been fantastic. The the fact I feel the greatest asset of this synagogue is that we've tried to take the job seriously. That that we've that that people here really did not want to just go through the motion to make go through their Judaism uh, out of a sense of obligation or for reasons of sentimentality, but they wanted to make their Judaism live, chai, to be alive. And I think that's that's happened. Uh, whether you look at the way we celebrate around here, uh, the way people have traditionally rolled up their sleeves, uh, the fact that this has not been an overly pretentious place, uh, th th this is very attractive. Also, we're we're in a in a time in Jewish life where we need we are desperately in need of people who are prepared to break out of the mold. And I think this synagogue has has tried to experiment and said, well. Maybe it is done this way in other places, but let's try it this way and let's see what happens. I'm, I'm proud of, of what I feel is a, a willingness to experiment, to innovate, and also at the same time a deep and abiding sense of respect for our tradition and a real uh, feeling and even sometimes a sense of urgency about recovering the treasures of our tradition. Can a temple ever stay the same? I think that a temple is like life. It just doesn't. It does doesn't change. It, it goes. It, temple go, a temple goes through cycles. Uh, I, I know that some people feel the temple's gotten too big. Um, there were people who, at every stage, when we hit 150, there were people who said, "Now it's gotten too big. It's time for me to to pull out." Um, uh, I don't think a temple can stay the same. I think a temple has got to evolve. I'm not convinced that uh, you do lose certain things when you get bigger. There's no question about it. But you have new opportunities, and I've always felt that the synagogue can, if it if it sets its will to it, create warm circles within the larger circle. And I think that we we have been working at doing that, and we're going to have even greater success in the future at doing that. We're a very young synagogue, and very young synagogues go through a lot of growing pains, and we have. But um, there's, there's so much excitement and potential here. What does a bar mitzvah for a temple mean to you? I think it means that we're we're taking on new responsibility. I, 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 I make a parallel between that and a bar mitzvah for a, a boy or a girl. We are, we are now saying that uh, we are a real synagogue. And we are established. We're not going under. And we have responsibilities now. We have responsibilities to uh, fend for a certain quality, to to take our place in leadership in this community. This Jewish community is desperately in need of good leadership, and we have some good leadership to offer. And we've got to mobilize that leadership. 
and we've got to fight some of the fights. We've got to do more at fighting some of the fights out there that need to be fought, feeding the hungry, uh, dealing with the, the, the homeless, uh, getting our community to have the courage to, to dialogue about Israel, support Israel, but also process the painful things that are happening in Israel. Uh, our, our community can, can do a great deal in this, in this area, and I hope so. I also feel that maybe in some ways we're going, because now we're established, we're going to be able to afford to return to some of the, I don't know, maybe some of the lighter, breezier moments of our youth. It's in some ways when you're clawing your way to just survive, just to make sure that you can literally pay your rabbi and pay the the uh, the mortgage. Sometimes it's sometimes you 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 do things that you you wish you didn't have to do. I, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to recover some of our uh, more inf more informal ways of dealing with certain things. Um, and I'd like to see some of the spontaneity return. I, I, I like to think about the, uh, the service where, when I was just here a couple of weeks, uh, right after I gave my sermon, uh, almost everybody in the congregation held up a card that had a number on it, as if this was an Olympic um, a gymnastics event. And the, car and the card said 9.2, 9.8, 8.9. Most of them were very high scores. It was a pretty good sermon. Only my wife held up a card that said 2.7. <laughs> my harshest critic. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of that kind of fun uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to maintain and go back to. There's a really fine team assembled here. Um, the staff of, of Temple High from from the people who work to the, in the office to to Sharona, Ava, um, you really have a very fine team. Tell me a little, little bit about about some of the people who who work that you work with and 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 the things that you like most about them. I'd love to, but first I've got to tell you, you've got to credit our late leadership. You have got to realize that before I came and since I came, our late leadership made the decision that they wanted to, 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 above everything, emphasize the, the quality of the staff. They wanted to really secure a staff that reflected their values and uh, their work ethic, their willingness to roll up their sleeves and take a broom and get on your hands and knees and do whatever you have to do to, to pitch in and make, make this thing happen. So you have to give credit to the lay leadership. Um, the and I, I feel I feel that I'm very fortunate. We we have a wonderful staff. We have a cantor who is one of the finest around, and people uh, people need to know that. And I, I wish everybody could travel around to other synagogues and compare, because they would come back and they would say they would realize how fortunate we are, not just to have a woman with a golden voice and who knows. Uh, how to, to use various kinds of Jewish music and in their appropriate places. Uh, but we also have a, a, a cantor who knows how to work with people, uh, who has built marvelous choirs. Uh, our our uh, young people love to sing with Sharona. They, they, they take these songs home with them. These songs become a part of their lives. We're, we're so blessed in that area. The, uh, our director of education, likewise, we, we have somebody we have, we're, we're fortunate. We have, so we have somebody who came up came up here through the ranks, who served for years and years and years on, on committees, who knows how to work with lay people, who loves children, who really got into this because of her love of children, who I think was worried about her Jewish and intellectual credentials, and who de was determined to, if she, if she got this job, to work very hard on the outside and on, on her own time to take care of that end of it, and has done it. So we have really the perfect combination, somebody who is a great... Uh, organizer, somebody who knows how to make things happen, uh, somebody who loves kids, respects children, uh, and somebody who has uh, uh, has developed the, the is developing the academic and intellectual credentials to, to run a top-flight Jewish school. When I've described uh, Ava Keenan to some of my colleagues, uh, they're very very envious. Uh, they're they're they tend to be most of the educators tend to either be uh, intellects who cannot relate well to, to children 
or they may relate well to children, but they don't relate well to adults, or, th or they don't have a, a, a feeling for curriculum. Uh, to me, uh, uh, Ava puts it all together, and uh, she's a very, very hard worker. So we're, we're very, very fortunate. The school is in great hands, and we have one of the fastest growing schools in the country. Uh, the, this great, we have people who drive a long, long ways to put their kids in, in our school. Um, she also knows how to work with teachers, and you've got to give our faculty credit. We've got, an, we've got a marvelous faculty. We've got a grassroots faculty, and she has cultivated and, and courted and motivated them, and they are they're just terrific. I, every one of them should, deserves, deserves mention. Uh, our new administrator, Marlene, has it's been a delight. We're still getting to know each other, but she, is, she comes earlier in the morning to the synagogue than I am. She often leaves later than I leave. A hard worker, and she has a great deal of uh, respect and, and love for for Jewish people and for her and for her Judaism, and uh, she's doing a great job helping us get organized here. I want to get into to some specific uh, uh, things that have happened here at the temple, but the one thing I, I want to ask you first of all, um, you're a product of the '60s, and so um, is Ava and, and Sharona, and and during the time that you were at Berkeley and and we were all in various places and a lot of member of the temples of the temple are products of the 60s how, how do you see what you're doing today and the idealism um, of the 60s um, how do you see that in your daily life today as a rabbi of a, of a large congregation Oh boy, um, that's a great question. I feel in some ways there is a straight line between the ideals, the best part of the 60s, people who were serious, I think it was a minority by the way, distinct minority of people who didn't have ulterior motives like just to avoid the draft, but people who were serious about saying, is there not a way to stop war? Are we really doomed? How many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever... Uh, stopped with the word. Um, um, so I think it's a straight line. I, I, I've tried to keep my idealism intact. I have to tell you, it takes a lot of work. And, and frankly, my Judaism kept it alive. I don't think I could have kept my, my idealism intact. I think I would have become uh, somebody who said, look, the, wor the world's the world. We can't, you can't do much to change it. Look out for yourself. Create a few good moments. If you get a little extra money, Give a little money to charity. Forget it. What are we supposed to do? As one of my cousins, what are we supposed to do? Take care of the world? Uh, if I didn't have my Judaism to nourish me, uh, I, I would have lost my idealism, which, which is at the core of my being. And it's, it's, it's what I'm about. And it's the core of Jewish being and Jewish soul. So I, I feel like there's a straight line. Hopefully what we're able to do is because, because Judaism is a, is a tradition with a great deal of wisdom, we're able to to lean on some, you know, we didn't have wisdom in the 60s. We had idealism and passion. We didn't have a lot of wisdom, a lot of sechel. You know, we made a lot of, there were a lot of hurtful things done, a lot of stupid things done. A lot of people got bashed around in the 60s. Now I think what we're trying to do is hopefully, uh, at least in this small community, create a place where, where there is community, or at least the chance for community, which is saying a lot in, in the America of the late 1980s, and also provide people with a way of rekindling and rekindling once again their idealism and also giving them a, a, tech, a spiritual technology so that they can increase the odds that their grandchildren will, will have idealism. You are known um, amongst the congregation as being somebody who um, is capable of uh, of surprising everybody. Um, you have uh, come out in a Superman costume during Purim, um, and and you have done some uh, very creative things um, for, for children's services. Um, but, but you're known, I think people say that you never know what's going to happen on a Friday night here. Uh, how do you feel about that? I feel great about that. And uh, I hope to be able to continue that. It 
take. I sometimes kind of get a little exhausted, but um, I'm hoping to continue that. Uh, I'm, I, 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 uh, I, I have some surprises up my sleeve that nobody knows about. <laughs> It'll be, time will tell. What, what do you see in the next 13 years? I see great things. I, I know that there'll be much struggle, and I know that there'll be a lot of changes. Part of it is the fact that Phoenix is a very transient community. Uh, that's troubling to me. Uh, I'm hoping, though, that, uh, that things will solidify, that the Phoenix and our own temple will be a little less uh, transient, that there'll be more, more stability. I see, I see great things. My, my gut feeling is that this synagogue is going to, is going to mature, that we're going to really make our mark in a lot of different areas. I think there's some areas that we're on the cutting edge in the American Jewish community. I think what we're doing with retreats, for example, uh, we have on the books, on the planning, we're planning five retreats this next year. Uh, there's a lot of magic, a lot of wonderful things can happen when you get people away from their suburban homes and up into the pine trees. Um, I foresee wonderful things. We haven't had much of a facility to work with. We've been, we've been, we've been. There's been so, in so many ways we, we've been hampered by that. And I don't think anybody really understands. When we have a facility. We're going to do a lot of things. One of the things that's going to happen, by the way, when we have a facility, which will be pretty soon, we're going to be able to bring in people from around the from around the world, people who will who will, who will help our synagogue not be cut off from the rest of the Jewish community. Abba Eben. Uh, some of the great, uh, great rabbis around the world to be able to come in and teach, and lecture, and we're our community is going to become more sophisticated, uh, more learned, and more involved in some of these things. I predict really exciting things in recovering Shabbat morning. We're the only Reform synagogue that in Phoenix that has Shabbat morning every Saturday morning, whether whether or not there's a bar mitzvah, and we're getting fourth, fifth, sixth generation American Jews who are recovering a sense of what Shabbat morning can be, the joy of Torah study, of using our brains to, to encounter this wisdom, uh, the joy of, 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 of davening, of, and, and, of, and of creating a davening which makes sense for our world, of really opening ourselves up to God and, and uh, learning, learning to communicate more and more with God. I, I just predict wonderful things and uh, great Lots and lots of great moments, the moments in people's lives, wonderful. Uh, we're we're going to start having weddings here. It's going to be so wonderful to be able to, to participate in the, in the weddings of, our, of, of the people that I've uh, been, that I've uh, had a hand in, in their bar and bat mitzvah. And we're going to have a whole new generation of people coming up for their bar and bat mitzvah. Uh, and of course I have my own kids coming up, and I, I'm so excited up, uh, about that. So I just predict lots of great, great, great things. Uh, one, one of the people we haven't talked about uh, right now, uh, and of course who uh, I think the congregation feels is a very, very important part of the congregation, is your wife. Um, what, does, what do you think that Shosh adds uh, uh, to this place? Well, she's the one that tells me to take out the garbage. So, therefore, uh, she's actually a very important person because she's on the front lines of of making sure that that um, I don't get cocky <laughs> and arrogant. <laughs> she reminds me who I am. Uh, that, that's a big part of it. She's my right arm. She's my soul. Uh, the full story will never be told. Although I suppose some su suspect it. Uh, uh, the the uh, inspiration that she gives me teaching. She's a great scholar in her own right. And um, some, pe some people know that, some don't. She's a, she's a top-notch scholar. She challenges me in terms of the, much of the material that I present to the synagogue. And on her own right, uh, she has been, she authored our Hebrew curriculum, which is, which is top-notch top and is being borrowed by more, used by more and more synagogues. She's a great lecturer in her own right. Uh, she, uh, I'd like to, to use her more in adult education, just that she's gotten... She, she, she gets offers from other places that, that she can't turn down where they pay her more money than we do. But um, she, she's a delight and she loves, uh, her greatest, greatest, I think, gift is that she loves Jewish people. She loves Jewish people and she loves Torah. And I think just her indirect influence 
um, will, I'm not sure could ever be measured uh, on a synagogue. People, in these days, people don't like to talk about the Rebetzin, the role of the Rebetzin. And, and my wife is, all, is concerned about having her independence and coming to synagogue when she wants to come on her terms. However, I think she's had a great, a great subtle, indirect impact on, on helping, on, having, on inspiring people to be Jewish. Just want to check on the battery here. Okay. I want to talk about some individual uh, life cycle events, things that have happened here. Tell me about uh, the uh, bar mitzvah of uh, Joel Hornstein. One of the most moving Shabbat mornings of my life. It's just very, very moving. Um, dealing with that family was so inspiring. We had a huge number of people here from all over the, all over the country. And Joel, his sweetness and his tenderness and his sense of humor, it was just a delight. It was, it was just a great honor to be a part of it. And it, it led, uh, you probably know, it led to our hosting the first national conference on the synagogue response to Jews with special needs. It, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that that single bar mitzvah set, set, set in motion the chain of events that led to that conference. It was just a staggering thing. I, I, there's no word to describe what it meant to be part of that miracle, which is what it was. People said it was impossible that Joel Hornstein could not be bar mitzvahed, that he couldn't do the Hebrew, he couldn't do the English, that he couldn't be taught, that he should be put away and forgotten about. And this congregation didn't forget about him. Is this a modern day miracle? I, I really, I really feel this is a miracle. You know, in, in the uh, in the midrash in Jewish teaching, it says that there's that uh, that there's no blessing without the work of the hands. A lot of people worked to make that miracle happen, make it happen, and. Uh, and it's also a mir in the original sense of the word miracle. The Hebrew word for miracle is nes, which means sign, as in the word significant. Something significant happened here. We signaled to a lot of people that this is possible. We also reinforced the the uh, the values of this congregation in a very powerful way to say we we're not here to turn people away. We're here to involve everybody. And we've had some trouble with with. Um, with people who felt that it's become expensive to belong here, and I and I and I am so pained over people who have felt that they they did not want to uh, endure what they felt was the embarrassment of paying dues, and I, and I'm hoping that we're going to have enough money donated and, and, and an endowment fund that we'll be able to say once again to people, come. We're not asking questions about your finances. It's difficult for us to do that at this point because we're we're, we're running on such a tight budget and we don't have of the huge, huge gifts to the general fund uh, to, to keep us going. Uh, Phoenix is not, this is not a wealthy Jewish community. So, uh, but, but Joel's Bar Mitzvah signaled to me, basically we say, oh, we want to have open arms to everybody. We, we, we took seven calls, Arab Rosh Hashanah, pe pe no other synagogue was answering calls. We told seven families who needed a place to go, come. They were new to Phoenix, didn't know where to go, no questions asked, we brought them in. We want to maintain that kind of openness, and I, and I think that's what that's about. When you spoke to other people about Joel Hornstein and that you were going to do his bar mitzvah, what kind of negative things did you hear about, about the attempt from outside the congregation? I, I did not hear negative uh, feedback. Possible there was some I didn't hear any. I think there are some people in some circles that feel that if somebody is does not have a certain intellectual level, that 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 it's perhaps making a mockery of the tradition. But I think anybody who says that does not have just doesn't have a deep understanding of, of, of the way this the way the Jewish tradition is developed. Traditionally, it's been thought that the people who are autistic don't connect. Did you see connection? Oh yeah, and you can you can see it to this day. If you watch uh, Joel in the synagogue, 
and you watch the way he feels in the synagogue. Uh, this is this is a home for him. This is a safe place for him, and that is, that's priceless. There's no there's nothing that could. Some things cannot be bought and not be sold, and that's one of them. You, the fact that somebody like that could could be could could have a home here, is a priceless thing. Natalie Goldberg, uh, her uh, bat mitzvah was also a very special occasion, not only for Natalie but for um, Jews in general. Tell me a little bit about that that uh, bat mitzvah. That was incredible. We were, <laughs> to our knowledge, it had never happened that 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 that. that uh, Bar Bat Mitzvah twin had gotten out of the Soviet Union in time for the twinning, and we, were, we found out that they could make it here. We, we were ecstatic. Uh, the the, we, the national we, we had we had so many calls from people around the country and congressmen and senators, uh, people who wanted to uh, be a part of it. It was, it was just breathtaking. And when she when this when when Julia held the, the Holocaust Torah in her hands and marched around with a, a Torah that had been saved. A Torah that had been captured, captive, and had been saved from the clutches of the Nazis. And when this young girl, who had been captive and not been free, gotten out, uh, got got out of Russia and held the Holocaust Torah and walked around our synagogue holding this Torah, uh, the symbolism was, was just too much. Was so powerful. The Holocaust is something that uh, happened before you were born. Uh, yet it is something that anybody who belongs here knows is something that you have not forgotten and that you want to make sure nobody else forgets. Please tell me um, um, why it is so important to you to be teaching that class and to be bringing speakers in and to participate in that. Well, I think one of the reasons I became a rabbi is because I, in studying the Holocaust in college, I realized that it was possible that Hitler could have a posthumous victory. And incidentally, that's still a possibility. There's no guarantees the Jewish people will survive. Um, and I realized that I have to, if, that if I had to do what I can to make sure. The, the other thing is that the period of silence is over. For, for the longest time, up until the late sixties, we couldn't talk about the Holocaust. People couldn't talk about it. It was a, it was a sacrilege to talk about it. Now we're beginning to talk, and we've got to make sure that the, mem that the memories are strong. That they're we have got to find a way to ritualize these memories to make sure that, th that they're passed on to generation after generation, which is something we know something about in, in Judaism. So. Um, it's vital to me uh, to bring in people. We, we brought in we brought in many survivors. I'm going to do something next year. I'm going to bring in uh, children of survivors and have them talk to the congregation about what it's like to grow up and be children of survivors. It's a very very important thing, and they're, they're sort of a link between our generation and the generation that went through that. And pretty soon, that's all we're all we're going to have around is witnesses. So it's it's a very important priority of mine, and I'm very proud of what we've done. And also in our seventh grade class, we've we've made a big we've done a very good job, I think, of teaching the Holocaust without scaring people, without without trying to frighten them, without showing gory movies, uh, but addressing the issues and making sure that that the memories are real. Our kids are going to face uh, skinheads and people, other people who are going to challenge them. Holocaust never even happened. Our kids can come and testify firsthand. They've seen the numbers on the on the people's arms. They've heard the stories, and they they will become witnesses. What connection do you see between the Holocaust and the Bat Mitzvah of Natalie Goldberg? Well, Natalie's Bat Mitzvah represent a a connecting up with. With the Jewish, with, with the Jewish community, that has been embattled, that has been almost frozen out of existence, and that miraculously has come back to life. Nobody predicted that the Russian Russian Jews, after after two and a half generations of of 
no Torah, no Hanukkah, no Passover, no matzah, no nothing could come back alive. And Natalie is a part of rekindling sparks of Torah in her Russian Jewish counterparts. Um, and the rekindling of sparks is what, I mean, after the Holocaust, what was our choice? Uh, to say, to, uh, in many ways, we were very entitled to say the hell with the world, the hell with this world. But coming out of the Holocaust, we said, we're going to affirm life. Chai. We're, we're, and, that, and that's how I, that's my feeling about this synagogue. This, the job of this synagogue is to, is to reaffirm life in the aftermath of the single greatest uh, uh, tragedy, loss of life, and desecration uh, in, in the history of the world. And I think that Natalie's bat mitzvah was, was very important in, 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 in terms of in, in our little sphere, the world of this synagogue, in rekindling that kind of feeling. Let's move to a brighter subject, Havara, or Havarot, in this temple. We have very active Havarot. Uh, tell me what that means to you. I, I feel it's one of, the, one of the great accomplishments of the synagogue. We have half our synagogue, Havarot, which is, uh, we, we know of no synagogues in the country that have more than half. Um, it's provided people with a chance to get to know each other, to be in one another's, you know, Homes, living rooms, kitchens. We live in a very private time. People, people don't go in one another's homes and kitchens. Chavaraz brought them each other's homes, given them a chance to, in those homes, away from the glare of the camera, away from, from the professional Jews like the rabbi and the cantor, to give them a chance to socialize, to, to pursue their own adult education on their own level, and to celebrate Jewish life, and to experiment. Uh, some of our Chavarot have experimented. Uh, we had a Chavara uh, uh, go down to the Verde River and, and experiment with a, uh, with a, a, a sort of a New Age Rosh Hashanah service. We had Chavarot uh, take on social action projects like going down uh, to the um, and feeding the hungry uh, on, on, on Christian holidays. Uh, we've had um, we've had Chavarot participate in with the Jewish Family Service and adopting Jewish fam poor Jewish families and providing food for the hungry. I'm very, I'm very proud of these Chavarot. Uh, some of them, some of the older ones are, are, are in trouble, need to be revitalized. I hope some of the people whose Chavarot have faded away will enter new Chavarot. In California, I, I was with many, many, worked with many people who it, it took two or three Chavarot before they found the right chemistry to be in a Chavara that would last. So I have great hopes. Uh, people in Chavarot have to have realistic expectations. Sometimes when the expectations are too high, the Chavarot uh, falls apart. But um, it's been very, very exciting. And my goal is to continue the Chavaratization of the synagogue, to give it a very, very high profile. And I think the Chavarot offers the, the best chance we have of giving people opportunities in small groups to revitalize, rekindle their Judaism, and bring them into the synagogue. Because if they know people, they're more comfortable in the synagogue. Now, I think that the, the, the single greatest reason for alienation in the modern synagogue is the fact that people don't really know each other. This is going to be a tough, tough question for you, but uh, I'm only allowing you one answer on this one. Okay. Um, what single event, what single thing, what single day, what single thought, what happened? In, in, in the five years that you've been here, has meant the most to you, been the most powerful to you? It's a very tough question. I, I guess what comes to my mind is the times that I've cried with my people. Crying, I, sitting on, uh, I'm not even sure people see me when I sit down and, uh, during silent meditation, but crying with Yom Kippur prayers or being with the family at a transition moment, being with the family when there's a birth or a death or something happy. I, you, you can't, I can't measure moments like that. But being with families at, 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 in, in, the, in those moments and being a part of their family is, I guess, what's most precious to me. What questions does Rabbi Burke ask himself these days? Hmm. I 
ask myself, what's going on with the Jewish world? What's going on with the Phoenix Jewish community? What is it about Phoenix that seems to make commitment so tough? I ask a lot about how we can get people to be in the synagogue without, and be active without, and form community without hurting each other. I ask, how do we keep idealism alive? Because it seems so fragile. So many people have a few moments of idealism and then retreat into a, a, a lives of complacency. And I want to, what, what, I ask myself, what can I do to change that? I, and personally, I, I'll have to tell you that I ask, I, I'm asking some very serious questions about my own, I continue to ask questions about my own, my own life, my, my own prayer life, my life with God. Um, and I, I have I have certain things that I have to deal with that other people don't. I have certain kinds of, there's certain danger in the rabbinate, certain kinds of arrogance that are built in to success. And I have to fight very hard to be myself and to keep being who I can be and to keep growing and to... I ask myself how I can keep straight with God and how I can keep from trying to pull the wool over God's eyes and over my own eyes. What would you like to, to say that I haven't asked you? Something that you'd like to talk about? You've asked me just about everything. Uh, there's a few funny moments that I... I yeah, haven't yeah. said that I... I'd, I'd like to hear those. I, I, I'll tell you a few of my, of my, what I call the great, great rabbinic bloopers. Okay. Um, um, one, that, for, one of the ones that, one of the, one of the ones that uh, really was amazing was the, uh, the um, funeral I did where you're supposed to cut the black ribbon of somebody that's died, and it was a very beautiful woman. And I was very nervous uh, for a number of different reasons, and I... I sliced open her dress instead of the ribbon, and I stood there with my mouth open, and I, I said, I, I've cut your dress. And she said, I, I know. And that was that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I, I love when I go in and I, I talk to the kindergartners about, about what it means to be a rabbi. Um, and one year I asked the question, what does it mean to be a rabbi? And um, I got um, the answer, uh, a rabbi is somebody who blows a whistle and tells us what page to turn to. And, and then one year I got the answer, um, a rabbi, well, well, you see, there's a box, and witches fly out of the box, and the rabbi is the one that puts the witches back in the box. Um, I like the time that I was getting ready to do a blessing of a baby. And I built up quite a bit of drama to, to this baby, the blessing of this baby. And this was a great, great moment, this blessing. At the very moment I put my hands on the baby, the doorbell rang. It was, it was a musical doorbell that played Moon River. <laughs> and um, the baby naming where I called on the parents. I'd, I'd been to a two, it was a two naming day. In the early morning, the parents cried as they described the, the, um, the name of the, of the kid of the new baby, and it was so meaningful that tied up the name to the generations, the grandfathers, and so meaningful. And I went to the next baby naming, and I built it up, built up the baby naming. And now we turn to that great moment where the parents link up this, this name to the generations and tell us why they've chosen the names they've chosen. And I turned over to the parents, and they said, well, we chose these names because they were sexy. Um, so, I have a few other moments in mind, but I have I, I have to look them up on a piece of paper. I'm, I'm forgetting them. I'll keep rolling a little bit for a few seconds to up the speed. Okay, go ahead. Uh, some, some of the moments I remember, the uh, like the time when I was actually um, cut. Ready to okay. go now. We're talking with, and it's, it's Judy Max, and you are one of the founders of Temple High. Uh, how did you come up with the name Temple High? Well, in the beginning we had a steering committee 
and um, originally we were planning to have a synagogue be an extension of another temple and things just didn't work out and the day that we met to discuss what our future was going to be at that point there were 18 people in a room and somebody pointed it out and they said why don't we call ourselves for a lack of a better name Temple Chai and it stuck. How does it feel as you look around now and you see that we have one of the largest Sunday schools in Arizona, Jewish Sunday schools in Arizona, and we, we're, we've grown from uh, just a couple of families uh, who sometimes met in your backyard to uh, a very substantial sized congregation to know that you were part of that. How does that make you feel? Well, I feel a lot of pride from the standpoint of this whole geographical area grew from a nucleus of almost nothing to what it is to be able to offer this for our children. Um, if that doesn't mean to say the other things that we offer isn't important, but for the children to have their own temple and to think of how we started. I was the first school administrator when between 60 and 90 kids to go to a full service temple that's now the largest school in the state. I just can't believe it. I mean, I didn't expect that so soon. I thought maybe 20 years, but we've been very fortunate. But tell me about the sense of pride. Um, um, I mean, being one of the original people who 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 was behind the, the founding of this temple, that must be a very special feeling. It, it is. I mean, it's a wonderful opportunity, and I recommend it to anyone who else is starting in a new community because it's something that it's just something that's a part of you. It's almost like having a, you know, in a way how you watch your children grow up and that's a special feeling and taking pride of their accomplishments. Well, I happen to have that advantage as a founder of feeling those same feelings of watching something grow from an infant to what it is today and also what we plan to be in the future. In a way, uh, the bar mitzvah of the temple, it's almost like um, as, as a founder that in a way that you're almost like you and your husband are the parents uh, of, of somebody who's going to be uh, bar or bat mitzvah. Um, do you sort of look at this celebration tonight in oh, that way? I'm sure that uh, my husband isn't here to speak for himself, but speaking for both of us, I think that's kind of how we feel. I feel many times like the mother of Temple Chai, I hope that doesn't make me old. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me what in the history of Temple High um, has made you feel most proud? Two things. One was the dedication here of this particular building or on this land before it was what it is today. And the second probably would rank first, and that was the B'nai Mitzvahs of the Goldberg, Natalie Goldberg, with Julia. Uh, that was very moving to me when Julia came here from Russia, going to the airport, meeting the family. I've never felt anything like that. Probably never will again. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, how, how we got the Holocaust uh, Torah. Well, we learned that there was an organization in uh, London, England that was housing Torahs that had been restored that were recovered from the Holocaust. And although we had no say-so over which Torah we would receive, we did file an application. And uh, it was granted because we were a new temple. And it's on loan to us, on permanent loan. We can never own it. And it was recaptured in, uh, from Czechoslovakia. And at the time we got it in 1977, it was 99 years old. And it was brought here through the donation of one of our families, one of our founding members' grandparents, donated the money to bring it here, and that's how we have it today. Are there any uh, signs uh, in the Torah? It means that the, the Torah is about 112 years old now. That's correct. Um, are there any um, signs um, of... Uh, of having gone through the Holocaust? Very definitely. If you were to unroll the entire 
uh, Torah, you would scrolls, you would see that some of the pages are seared. I've seen them. I think they're near one of the ends. They have like a brown searing. And um, there are places that I've noticed that some of the rabbis, I can't remember, I think it was Rabbi Kurtz or it could have been Rabbi Burke, commented on some of the commentary was difficult to read because it had been seared. But so since so much of it was legible, they were able to save it. Now, you heard a story that, uh, um, that, that somebody actually perished as a result of, uh, what did you hear about? Well, the gentleman who rushed in, the synagogue was burned. And uh, this is why the Torah is burned. The synagogue was on fire. And a gentleman that rushed in to save it, I was told, I have no documentation to back this up, but I was told uh, by the organization in London that sent it to us that he himself perished. Uh, I don't mean that he died at the moment he was saving it, but he, he perished there in essence due to trying to save artifacts within the synagogue. And that's as much as I know. We've never been able to find out exactly what really happened to him. Okay. Is there something that you'd like to say or add that I haven't asked you? Well, I would like to say that for people who are now joining the synagogue and feel like they're not a part of the beginning, that that's not true. Everything is a beginning, the beginning of each year. And what happens 20 years from now is going to depend on all those people who are active today. So I think that in an essence that we have a lot yet to accomplish, a lot of programs. We have no senior citizens program within our temple, for example. So there's a lot of new beginnings of things that can still happen within this temple. And I think in that sense, other people can be founders. Nobody has ever told them about the Torah. Judy, why don't you describe what you're seeing right here? What you're seeing is the smoke damage. If we continued to roll the Torah back, it would be so badly damaged, it would be illegible. But you can see the smoke damage. Also, you'll see watermarks here because at this end of the Torah, it was watermarked. We presume, as it was rescued out of a burning synagogue, that they dampened it or did something to, to keep it from actually burning. This, uh, this Torah would deter, as we continue going in this direction, which is the end of the year, uh, you would see that it's badly damaged. And that also has significance. It's telling us roughly what time of year this Torah was rescued. As we start at the beginning of the year, there's not very much damage, which means it was rolled up at that time. And you can see all the, you can almost pick it up with your finger. Look at here, all the burned smoke damage. And on the back of one side, we even wonder if it's blood. People died saving this Torah. Okay, let's get some close-ups. Yeah. The other thing I might add is even though this Torah is 112 years of age, this kind of damage is not aging. That's actual smoke from where it was in the synagogue. I believe it was in Prague, as a matter of fact. At this point on the Torah, you can see holes. I mean, we're not holding it up where you can really see it, but this is where it's actually burnt through. And if you were conducting a service, it's very difficult to read the Torah the further back we go because there's a considerable amount of damage. <laughs> 